Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. This is part one of a two-part series on Kabbalah and physics. With me is Dr. Quantum, also known as Fred Allen Wolf, my dear old friend, author of numerous exciting books on physics, winner of the National Book Award. Some of his books include Space, Time, and Beyond, The Dreaming Universe, The Spiritual Universe, The Body Quantum, Mind into Matter, Matter into Feeling, The Yoga of Time Travel, Space loops and time twists, or did I get that backwards? Time loops and space twists, but it's okay. They're both uh, loopy. Time, time loops and space twists, how God created the universe. Welcome, Fred. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's a pleasure to be back here with you again, my old buddy. Yeah, yeah, we go back a long we, way. We sure do. We were roommates in San Francisco during the heyday. Yeah, yeah, 1976, as I recall. Exactly. And those were exciting years. And now, interestingly, you began your study of Kabbalah even before that? Uh, it actually did occur before that because in 1974, uh, 1973 through 75, I had, I had taken I had, had taken a sabbatical leave from my post at San San Diego State University mm -hmm. and uh, was uh, uh, hopping the pond between. London and Paris. I had visiting professorships at the University of London, Birkbeck College, and the University of Paris uh, in Orsayville, which is a, a slightly south of Paris. And so um, while I was in my Paris flat, uh, I got a book from my friend Bob Tobin, uh, who said, uh, why don't you look look at this book. It was called The Cipher of Genesis, and it was all about a Kabbalistic interpretation of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I thought, my God, I'm a physicist. What should I be looking at this for? Yeah. So I read it and looked through it, and it looked kind of interesting, particularly mm -hmm. because the Hebrew letters as Suarez, Carlos Suarez, who was the author of the Cipher of Genesis, as he presented these, uh, these, these, the Hebrew letters, each letter was a conceptual foundation. It was actually a word. So, for uh, so, for example, we use letters in our ordinary language, A, B, C, uh, but A is itself not a word. It's just simply a sound, mm -hmm. but. The first letter of the Aleph Beit, which we get al alphabet from, yes. is Hebrew Aleph. Alphabet Hebrew, is uh, Hebrew Aleph alphabet Beit. is yeah. Aleph, and Aleph itself is not just a letter. It's not just A. Ah. In fact, it's actually a silent letter, but it's a letter spelled out with other letters, yeah. and each letter is spelled out, and so forth. So, the fact that this became intricate and complex intrigued me. Mm -hmm. So I decided I'm going to look up Carlos Suarez, who my friend Bob Tobin had said, by the way, he's living in Paris. Yeah. So I looked him up, went to visit him, and after a kind of a stormy initial meeting, he asked, uh, he he, he asked me, did I get anything out of reading the book? And I told him, well, I'm a quantum physicist. He says he's not interested in quantum physics at all. Uh, did he, he wanted to know what I saw. And I said, well, I was interested in Satan. Hmm. <laughs> he kind of smiled a little bit. And he said, well, what did you see? And so I said, well, the way Satan is spelled with the Hebrew letters, they, I, when I spell these letters out, I can see pictures. And as soon as I said that, he got very, very interested, and he said, look, I've had rabbis galore coming here to see me. By the way, he spoke fluent English. He was French, but he spoke fluent English, and he said, they don't understand a thing about what I'm saying here. You do, I want you to come back, and if you have other people interested in this kind of thing, have them come too. So, I left. Carlos Suarez's apartment, uh, very near the Eiffel Tower, um, and went back to my apartment, which was in uh, near the Cathedral Notre Dame. And uh, interesting, I just mentioned these uh, sightseeing mm -hmm. spots. And um, 
I called uh, Bob, and Bob immediately got on a plane and hopped uh, hopped over to Paris. My friend Jack Sarfati also hopped over from Terrest, and some other people, Jill Purse for one, and some other people from London also came, and before long we had a gathering, and we all began to sit at the foot, the feet of Carlos Suarez, and listen to what he had to say about Kabbalah. And uh, as I listened, I became intrigued. And this is what started me off thinking about a whole bunch of things mm -hmm. which I saw in the Kabbalistic yeah. interpretation. So by the time you and I were apartment mates back in 1976, you were, had already co-authored your first book based on uh, the Space, Time, and Beyond with Bob Tobin. And Jack Sarfati. And Jack Sarfati. Yes, yeah. uh, Bob and Jack and I put together Space, Time, and Beyond, uh, and uh, it was an, an international hit right away. It just took off like... Yeah. It's amazing. People were looking for something that would tie in quantum physics and consciousness, and there your book was, and, and that was uh, well over 30 years ago. Yes, and right after that, then uh, Fritjof Capra, mm -hmm. the Tao of Physics came out, and uh, Gary Zukov's uh, The Dancing Wooly Masters, and then I wrote my own book called Taking the Quantum Leap, mm -hmm. which is also a big seller, and won the National Book Award. So there was a hunger at that time for the mystical, magical, physical, meaning of life. Mm -hmm. I think the free love movement had just passed through San Francisco at that time. It was beginning to wane. Uh, the Vietnam War was wavering. So uh, the country was undergoing a kind of a transformation. And uh, we few who were into the merger between what the mystical and the magical and the physical, quantum physical to be specific, were saying to each other became a uh, kind of a, a highlight. Almost legendary at this point. In it, fact, it, it, yes, legendary. Many books have been written about that era now, including, uh, for example, How the Hippies Save Physics, right, which features right. you extensively. And, 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 and mostly Jack, but uh, uh -huh. yes. <laughs> yes uh, but, but anyway, yes, that's true. So establishing now for uh, our viewers that you studied Kabbalah with Carlos Suarez, let's just talk a little bit about him. He was a legendary figure in his own right. In, in fact, a very famous uh, set of novels uh, were basically based on him. Yes, Lawrence Durrell was a personal friend who wrote the Alexandria Quartet, and Balthazar, one of the characters in the Alexandria Quartet, is a representation, or you might say a fictionalized version, of Carlos Suarez. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Carlos Suarez was uh, primarily engaged as an architect in Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, he was an uh, Egyptian Jew, mm -hmm. and uh, he was also uh, in, into art, and he began writing. He got very interested in Kabbalah. Um, I'm not even sure why, but uh, uh, then he moved to Paris, uh, had this wonderful flat up on the, the sixth floor of, a, of an apartment, or as I said, overlooking the Eiffel Tower. And he had a, an interesting kind of new insight into what is the meaning of Kabbalah. And other Kabbalists who know of Suarez's work kind of don't even mention him. He's like, he's like on the outside of where, what their, I would say, left brain pre academic mm -hmm. more or less academic vision of Kabbalah. Well, it's Suarez not as if that way. Kabbalah is a unified field of study or a well organized field of study. There are many different threads. Unfortunately that's true. Uh, and the point that I found interesting about Suarez <coughs> is that one of the most important developments that he was bringing out, which all the other Kabbalists I've ever looked at do not bring out, is feeling. Mm -hmm. Human beings created Kabbalah, not machines. It's not an intellectual study. It's really a thing which involves the whole human being. You feel something as you get involved with what the meaning of these terms are. And when you have these meanings come through you, it changes you. And that's what I think uh, the Kabbalists 
maybe originally were trying to do, but the modernized version of it, including modern Judaism, which has almost dropped any of the mystical interpretation mm. of Kabbalah, uh, seems to do. That's what Suarez was bringing out, and that's what I found so interesting about him. But the thing which really got me wasn't that. It was, I saw some parallels between the meaning of the Hebrew letters, and of all things, my field, quantum physics. And there were several par par parallels, which I thought were fascinating. And uh, I wrote about them uh, in a book that I uh, kind of co-authored, not really, but uh, I helped Suarez uh, write a book that he had already written in French called The Spectrograms of the Hebrew Letters. Mm -hmm. And I added some my own notes throughout, scattered throughout it, and I added a whole chapter to it because I thought this would explain how quantum physics interacts with uh, Kabbalah. In other words, he would pronounce the letters, you would create a voice analysis. That's right. And the voice analysis itself uh, was presented in graphic format as a picture, and that picture had certain meanings. That's right. When you do a spectrogram, you get a frequency versus intensity versus time picture. It's almost three-dimensional. And uh, these structures that you see uh, give you uh, some kind of, well, you might say a picture of what the meaning of the sound is. So when Suarez would pronounce Aleph, uh, it would come out in a certain way with a, uh, a picture like, it would look like a foot. Quantum physics is full of paradoxes, as, as we know, but it's largely a very rational, logical discipline with mathematical formulas, and Kabbalah is, as you say, it's stories within stories within stories. Every letter is a word. Every word is made out of letters. And right. so it's, it's like an infinite regress of stories. That's right. And when one uh, learns uh, how to read the Bible in its original Hebrew as much, best as you can find that source, um, you see there's a meaning in the letters as they're, as they're spelled out which transcends the actual word that is mm -hmm. being portrayed. Uh, and that transcendence, uh, when you interpret what the letters are saying, uh, is very interesting. That when one looks letter by letter into a sentence such as God created the earth, uh, it begins to give you a sense of just how that was accomplished. Exactly. In fact, if you take, l let me just do one word. All right. Light. Light. Yeah. I've been fascinated with light ever since I was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. The Hebrew word for light is or, which we get the word O-R-E, which means gold or whatever, or something rare. Mm -hmm. But in Hebrew, it's spelled Aleph, then Vav, then Resh, or a u are mm -hmm. in a mo and yeah. and what that means Aleph is means something spiritual I'll, I'm, I'll, yeah. I'm gonna the mystical Aleph the, mystical the silent Aleph, letter the silent letter from which everything comes into being but itself is not in being yeah. Vav means fertilization so Vav is the act of disseminating or disseminating or producing the 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 essence of Aleph and Resh is the Hebrew word for the back of the head, but it's also the Hebrew word for universe. Mm -hmm. So what I light is, light is spirit disseminating through the universe. Mm -hmm. And in many ancient traditions, light and love are the same thing. God is light. Is the same. Many, many traditions have that combination. They intuitively grasp that situation. Mm -hmm. And what intrigued me is that in that sentence from the Hebrew, uh, in God said, uh, in the, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Yes. Uh, the fact that light is mentioned twice in the same sentence has more significance than just, oh, he just said it twice. It means there is meaning associated with having two lights in one sentence. The Kabbalists don't waste time. Mm -hmm. They have, whenever they mention something twice, it has a special meaning. Mm -hmm. So I began to wonder, what is that special meaning? And later on, we'll probably talk about this, uh, that the special meaning has to do with there may be two physical forms of light. And that's what I wrote about in one of my books, which called Time Loops and mm -hmm. Space Twists. And we can 
get into that a little later. Well, we will do a separate series of interviews on space and time and consciousness, but yeah. with regard to Kabbalah and consciousness, it seems that the great mystery is how, how it is that we uh, animals, we, we material creatures, have spirit, have consciousness. It's a great mystery, and as I said, one of the things that Suarez brought out uh, was the notion of feeling as mm -hmm. being a very important part yeah. of the meaning of Kabbalah, which I don't see in any of the other Kabbalistic interpretations. Mm -hmm. And that got me thinking a great deal uh, when we when I started to to think further into it, um, it began a series of books called Mind Into Matter and Matter Into Feeling. Right. Because my interest was, well, what do these Hebrew letters have to do with being a human being? Mm -hmm. And specifically, what is there about us that makes us so unique? And I came to the conclusion that the base fundamental vibration of the whole universe that we, f that is embedded in the human body is feeling. Mm -hmm. That feeling is primal. That everything feels, including plants, animals, everything. Mm -hmm. they, feeling is primary. It's a fundamental vibration of everything. Yep. And we can interpret that feeling or bridge it up into various different it's not so different than Freud's notion of uh, humans being primarily influenced by the pleasure principle. Yes, pleasure is important, but it's it, it is it, the feeling is 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 more primal than pleasure yeah. or pain, okay. which are dichotomies which arise. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, pleasure and pain are essentially the same thing. One is a, is a flip coin of the other, but mm. they're essentially the same basic principles involved as far as I understand mm -hmm. the psychological meaning of it all. But feeling is so fundamental. Um, I, I began to think about Jung, mm -hmm. Carl Jung. And I began to think about what he saw, because he became more mystical than Freud. The great Swiss psychiatrist. The great Swiss psychiatrist. And what he began to see was that human beings operate under four different modes of operation. They are feeling types, they're intuitive types, they are sensation types, or they're thinking types. Right. So the four modes of operation, or personality traits, how you want to call them, are thinking, feeling, sensing, and intuiting. Right. And I immediately saw those as quantum physical. And I saw feeling as associated with water. Mm -hmm. So where there's, where there's water, there's life. Where there's water, there's feeling. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, I think, is an important aspect of it. I mean, you may make the metaphor, the ocean is a feeling thing. It's not a dead thing. It feels. Well, in, in so, a mythological sense, water is associated with feeling. But how is that quantum physical? Well, I'm getting to that. <laughs> it's, it's interesting when you have, to, you have to kind of go through these four different things to see it. Yeah. Um, the opposite aspect of feeling, or that, that which is counter to it, is thinking. Mm -hmm. we, uh, Jung would point out that, that often scientific types or logical head types uh, cannot identify with feeling types. That feeling types, right. they seem to communicate at cross purposes a mm -hmm. lot of the time. Yep. So, I began to think, where do we see this in quantum physics? And, and I began to say, think that maybe what we're looking at is feeling. Is feeling is vibrational. Mm -hmm. It's the wave. It's the quantum wave. So this is how my thinking went. Mm -hmm. So the so-called vibrational modes which fill the universe with quantum fields or vibrational mm -hmm. modes filling the universe is feeling. And thinking is what happens when you change feeling into particle. When you change wave into particle, Everything's particles... discrete. Discrete. Mm -hmm. So you go from continuously all over the place to discrete countiness. Yeah. And when you go into discrete countiness, what arises out of that is mathematics. Because mathematics is simply the method by which we distinguish one thing from another. Mm -hmm. And that's all mathematics really is at its base. Mm -hmm. And that's a thinking function, discriminating one thing from the other. Mm -hmm. So I thought, ah, feeling and thinking, wave and particle. Yes. And then I began thinking, what about intuition and sensation? 
And I thought, what is going on there? What what is what is involved with intuiting, and what is involved with sensation? And I began to think of intuition as something which is a precognition of what's to come. Mm -hmm. When you have an intuition, you're more or less seeing ahead in time. Mm -hmm. We are the animals that had intuition galore as when the Oogaboogas came out to grab us, we knew before we got grabbed. The ones that didn't have intuition, they're dead. They're gone. They've been eaten. <laughs> they're not around. Human yeah. beings are very intuitive. At least we're the descendants of the ones who survived. Ex we're the descendants of the ones who have intuition. In other words, yeah. there is a magical quality mm -hmm. of being able to see into the future that every human being has. Mm -hmm. We all have it. Otherwise, we couldn't operate. We're all, everybody has it to some, and you can develop it. Uh, but there's the intuitive side. So intuition, I looked at, well, what is intuition in physics? And I thought, what intuition is movement from one place to another. Mm -hmm. And that is associated with the quantum variable called momentum, mm -hmm. things moving from one thing to another. Mm -hmm. Sensation is the opposite, so what is that? Well, that's not moving. That's here now, here now, here now. That's being here, being there, being here, uh -huh. being there. Yep. So sensations occur here, here, there, there. We have sensations and we feel things in different parts of our body because that's where sensations it's arise. So in other words, when you focus on your sensations, you're getting right into the present moment. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's what uh, Ram Das used to say, be here now. Yeah. The problem with being here now is that nobody can be here now. You have to, you're actually everywhere at the same time. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> so being here now is means focusing on your body, on your sensation. It's a good thing to be able to do that, but don't stick don't stick there. Mm -hmm. Because you've got to allow the intuition to flow. Intuition is like a flow. Sensation is like a stop. Mm -hmm. uh, feeling is like a flow. Thinking is like a stop. Mm -hmm. So if you think too much, you get stuck and you lose out on the magical qualities mm -hmm. of feeling. If you are in touch with sensations, oh, le vol, le, the wine is so good, I like the taste of the cheese, I love it so much. If you get too stuff on that kind of stuff, <laughs> <laughs> You lose all your intuition. Yeah. You ask a wine taster, well, what what's going to be the next? Uh, I, don't, I don't know what's going to be this. I only eat the cheese. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so you're saying sensation brings us into the here and now. Exactly. Intuition focuses on the future. But on, are, is that on, the, a, on the whole movement between future, present, and even past. Okay. So I intuition is, 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 is the flow. It's the flow through spaces. And uh -huh. time. As opposed to being just in the now. Exactly, exactly. Okay. It's like the, similar to the wave particle duality. It's just a different sort of duality. There's the wave particle duality would have to do with what we call energy and time, and the wave particle duality would just to do with momentum and position, mm -hmm. or location. And feeling is more associated with w energy wave, yes. and thinking is more associated with temporal thoughts. I mean, where are our thoughts? They're in time, but where do they actually live? They don't live anywhere. But sensations live somewhere. We can feel mm -hmm. them in various parts. They're, 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 they're in a sense more real than thoughts. Thoughts, yep. you, you can't, my thought is in this part of my head, right there. Uh, it's not there, it's not there, you know. But uh, I feel the pinprick there, yes you do. Uh -huh. So there is a difference between a thought and a sensation. So well, and what you're getting at is the, the nature of the human being. Sometimes we're in time and space and sometimes we seem completely yeah, separate. Exactly, exactly. And I if you if you are a uh, I, if you're an intuitive feeling type of person, you would you'd be what I would call out there, man. You're <laughs> out there, man. You're really there. I mean, the free love movement in yeah. San Francisco was feeling intuitives operating all over the place. I mean, that's what I guess uh, some of the great LSDs and marijuanas and all these other exciting mm. uh, substances that we all took back in that time. That's what got opened up. Yeah. Why? Because we got we were stuck in thinking and sensing. It's thinking and sensing, and that if you stay stuck there, it 
it, it evokes fear. Yeah. It evokes fear because oh, what's going to happen to me, me my buddy? I'm going to. You, know, you get stuck in that, or yeah. thinking about your. I'm not going to mm -hmm. have my money anymore. You get stuck, so everybody's in fear mode, and that's a lot to do with why people get afraid because they get stuck. They let go, or they forgot how to get back into that flow of feeling and energy, and that's mm -hmm. what. Uh, by, that's what my book Mind of the Matter is really all about and that's all inspired from Carlos Suarez who uh, initiated the inquiry into that. Well Fred Allen Wolf it's been a pleasure this half hour has gone by very very quickly. Yes, yes. Uh, I enjoyed it thoroughly what a delight to be with you again thank you so much Fred. Thank you. And thank you for being with us, be sure to check your listings for part two of our two-part series on Kabbalah and physics with Dr. Quantum.